Welcome back to Body Talk with Bex. This week I have the first half of a two-part episode with Cameron. She's a lovely young woman on the other side of the U.S. who also has bladder extrophy. So I'm really excited to talk to her and let's just jump right on in to this episode. All right. And so I think something that I've noticed talking to a few other people with bladder extrophy is that the parents don't really seem to know ahead of time that they're going to have bladder extrophy. Do you know if your parents knew or not? They didn't at all. My mom was very sick throughout the pregnancy. Mm. She went to the doctor, she got sonograms and ultrasounds and everything like that. And they were like, no, seems fine. You're all good. They did say a lot, though. The doctors were like, if anything, she's just going to be stunted. Like I would have like small limbs or just small in general, which I am. I'm only like 4'11", so I'm very small. But absolutely nothing. It was just a very bad pregnancy, she said, because I have an older sister. And she was like, no nothing like that pregnancy at all so it was a shock when I came out they were like what is that and the doctors didn't even know what it was as it goes like that most of the time yeah yeah definitely (laughs) so did you have a surgery right away to try to put it back so what happened was is that I was born and they were like oh my god and they didn't know what I was born in Staten Island. Okay. So they didn't know what it was. The hospital that I was at, it wasn't like a hospital that specialized in this. It was just a hospital on the island. So they were like, maybe it's like a birthmark or something. And then they were like, oh wait, that's her bladder. They I think it was the following day I was operated on. But again, they didn't know what that what they were doing. So they kind of just shoved it back in and sewed me up and from that moment like my doctor now even told me they were like whatever they did to you then prevented you from peeing normally or peeing vaginally like that was off the table at that point whatever they did to you just you couldn't do that anymore so I don't know what they did but they didn't know what they were doing right turns out they also said like oh don't keep her still and I moved around a lot and it came back out like a few days later. So you have a very similar experience then to, to Kylie. Yeah. <laughs> Kylie and I talk all the time. And when we were first going through this, she was like, oh my God, they're exactly the same stories. So I guess that just shows the importance of like, if you don't know what you're doing, maybe try to find a specialist who does know. That's what they should have done right away. And then... You know, eventually they were like, well, we don't know what we're doing. So let's send you somewhere where they do. <laughs> and that's when they recommended me to John Hopkins with Dr. Gerhardt. Oh, okay. How, yeah. how far away is that from, from where you are? So right now I moved to Freehold, New Jersey five years ago. It's about either exactly two hours or a little over two hours. Okay. That's from here. So it's not that That's far. not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, it's a car drive. I don't have to go on a plane or anything like that. Okay. And I take it very different experiences than at this, yeah, Yeah. at John Hopkins. Very much so. They actually know what they're doing there. They have a whole team of doctors that specialize in it, and they've been my doctors since. So a lot of the information, by the way, I'm saying, like, because I was a baby, like, it's very fuzzy. I only have like one distinct memory, but we could get to that later. So I asked my parents and because it was so traumatic and everything like that, a lot of it, like they even said, they're like, we blocked a lot of it out because it it was just so traumatic that we didn't want to like relive it. But they did give me like some important information that I can share. But I know they met with Dr. Gerhardt first and they, he was so good. He explained everything. Like they, they trusted him immediately, which is obviously what you want in a doctor. And yeah, he was like, this is how it's going to be. This is exactly what we're going to do. Ran them through everything. And I believe 11 months later, 
So in April, because I was born in May, so it was April 2000, I had my surgery, like my reclosure that, like my second reclosure, the one that actually worked. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then from that point on, besides like checkups here and there, I guess, I didn't have another surgery until I was 90. Okay. I waited a really long time. Wow, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's a good thing, though. I mean, if you didn't need a surgery. I mean, the thing is, it's like, okay, so I got the initial or the reclosure, you could say. And I basically was just wearing pull-ups or diapers until 2019. Uh, Not 2019, sorry, until I was 19. (laughs) And yeah. So I didn't need the surgery. Obviously, it would have been nice to get it sooner. Yeah. But even when I talk to my parents now, they're like, honestly, it's so nice that you waited. They put it on me. They were like, you you tell us when you're ready. Because that's what the doctor said. They're like, she's going to tell you when she's ready to wear like little panties and everything. Like that. <laughs> so they waited until I said that I was ready. And I mean, it took like... 19 years but that was the point where I'm like I just want to close that chapter of my life I just want it to be over and I want to start you know being an adult yeah as much as I can be because you know I still have some restrictions right that makes sense yeah yeah so yeah just basically I wore pull-ups the whole time and then I can't really remember going back for checkups to be honest I mean yeah uh, maybe I blocked it out, but I just, I can't remember anything. I was really just living with it until I was like, yeah, I'm over it. I just, I don't want to wear diapers anymore because it gets in the way of everything. Yeah. So you just had a lot of like incontinence then? Yeah, basically I was just incontinent and it was just a constant leak. Like, oh, that's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. So I would change from like, diapers or pull-ups like every honestly even like just regular if I didn't have this problem it depends on how much you drink that day yeah. and what you're doing and everything like that so if I was more active or if I was drinking more water it I would have to change more often whereas sometimes I'd be like oh it's been like four or five hours and I don't have to change because I'm just sitting here or like it it wasn't that I needed to but it was frustrating a lot especially growing up because you want to do like they didn't restrict me from doing anything. I was just a person that didn't want to do anything. <laughs> I would always cry if they put me in any programs or anything like that. But yeah, it was really hard, like going to pool parties or going to sleepovers because I couldn't wear certain things. And that sounds like so trivial, but when you're a kid, oh, it's, it's the like the world. world. Yeah. It does the world. Like you just, so many times, especially like, I want to say more like middle school and like early high school, I would just like the summer was like my worst fear. Like I love the summer, but I was like, I hate this because I can't wear what I want. And when I was invited to pool parties, I would either be like, so like I would go and get a bathing suit that I really like. And then I would cut like the little swimmer to fit the pull up. So I, w- so I was able to wear a bathing suit because at that time I couldn't, not wear anything with a bathing suit because it would just run down my leg to be honest Aww. yeah so now like I could kind of do it because I I had a major surgery but I still have to have another one so I still do leak okay. a little bit and so you don't have to cath or anything like that no I do yeah. actually <laughs> yeah so I have a Mitrofanov so it's really cool I pee out of my belly button. <laughs> That's the fun way to say yeah. it. But yeah, well, I'm right now on a schedule where I pee every four hours or as needed. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I love it. <laughs> it's kind of weird to like love that because I feel like a lot of people in our situation would be like, oh, it's probably so annoying. And it can be. But at the same time, it's like it makes using public restrooms so much better. Oh, yeah. You don't even have to sit down, technically. I mean, <laughs> technically. I mean, you could, but I'm just like, nah, I'll just. just public toilets are gross yeah. anyways. You don't want to sit on those. <laughs> yeah. So it, 
it makes certain things easier. Like road trips are a little bit easier and just in general, I don't know. I like it so much better. I mean, I have like a weird scar, like my belly button's a weird scar and everything like that. But I just tell people that it's like a shark bite and they just leave me alone with it. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) You always have all those nosy people and you're like, yeah, it's just a shark bite. Like it's nothing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I still have my scar. I had my Mitrofnoff like reversed so I don't have it anymore. But I Mm -hmm. still have like the giant scar from it. So, so I was confused with that because I was listening to your podcast and (laughs) I heard that you said that you got it reversed. So, like, what's the situation now? If you don't mind me asking, like, what? Yeah, (laughs) I I don't cast at all. I'm fully continent during the day. I still have trouble at night. Okay, but otherwise, I function normally now That's so, so cool. <laughs> yeah so what do you do at night do you wear like a pad or I have a lot of the I can't remember what they're called but they're like the waterproof pads for the bed for the mattress oh okay. yeah so I put those down like under the sheets and kind of just lay around and yeah oh and I don't have That's trouble every cool. night it's just some nights wow yeah. That's so interesting. Like, I've never met somebody with BE that was able to be, like, fully continent and, like, didn't have to cap. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that uncommon until I, until I started talking to more people about it. And, mm-hmm. yeah, I haven't met anyone else that is, so. That's, like, that's so good for you. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So, I when I was listening, like, I know that you went through a lot of surgeries too. Yeah. Lots of surgeries, lots of tests, things like that, monitoring, you know, bladder growth and, you know, if I can feel things essentially, because a lot of times for females with bladder extrophy, we can't even feel when we're full and like when we have to go. And I did. And (laughs) I think my mom talked about it. Like the very first doctor that I ever had didn't believe that that was possible. And so even though like I was telling her and my mom was telling her like, no, she can feel it. She has to go. Our doctor was just like, no, she can't. Yeah. yeah. Super uncommon. Like your, your situation is super uncommon to what I've heard because I can't really feel anything. It'll be, I also, okay, I should probably explain, like, my my situation. (laughs) That would help. So when I got operated on, I got operated on in April of 2019. And basically, they said to me, your original platter is not usable. Back in, I'm mixing this whole thing up. That's okay. (laughs) I'm so sorry. Okay, so what happened was that in January of 2019, I finally decided I want to go for my surgery. I was going to be turning 20 the following year, and I was like, you know what? it It's time. So I went for a examination under anesthesia, mm-hmm. and they examined me because it's been 19 years since they saw what was going on with me. And they did a test where I don't know exactly what kind of liquid they used, but they used some kind of liquid to fill up my bladder to see the capacity. Mm -hmm. And while they were doing that, it tore. The bladder tore. So, yes. So, what was supposed to be like a 30 minute procedure, like we booked a hotel for one day and then we were going to leave the following day, turned into like a week's stay. Wow. So, I, I was so scared to go under anesthesia, too, because obviously it was my not my first time, but, like, remembering it right. was my first time. So I was already nervous as it is. So I was like, oh, it's just 30 minutes or whatever. Surprise! No. <laughs> Surprise! And I woke up in, I think, like, the ICU, and I had, like, tubes coming out of everywhere. Like, I had two tubes coming out of, like around like my waist area like a little below my waist I had like a tube up my nose and down my throat oh my gosh (laughs) my legs were numb like I it was really really bad like I was so confused I was like what's happening because you you go in for one thing and then you come out and you're like what just happened so my bladder tore during the examination and they had to 
stitch it up and everything like that. So I had to stay in the hospital so they could just like monitor that, making sure that it was all okay. But then obviously, even though they sewed it up, I noticed might have also been psychosomatic, but I noticed that I was leaking more after that. Oh no. Yeah. So like I was leaking pretty bad before, but after that, it was just so much more. And again, that could have just been in my head, but so I was in the hospital for five days and basically they were just telling me like, okay, well, we're going to plan your surgery for April. So I was like, great. I have to deal with this for what? Like Three, four months. Four months. <laughs> So I had taken off that semester of school. So that was like spring 2019 semester because I was in college when this was going on. So I just took off the semester because I was like, I, I know I can't do this in school. It's just not possible. So I, I don't want to say I dropped out, but I took a semester off and I was like, okay, just dedicated to medical. From January, just stuff that was going on in my personal life until honestly September I was in the biggest depression of my life (laughs) it was pretty bad between personal stuff and medical stuff and with medical stuff it just kept getting worse in between leading up to my appointments my like actual surgical appointment I would have to go to Hopkins for I can't think of the name of it like therapy basically Mm -hmm to talk and see what's going on and there was so much going on in my life at that point anyway so I was just like I need therapy right now (laughs) and honestly during the therapy sessions I didn't even talk about anything to do with medical where like the the doctor came out and they were just like seems like she's completely okay with it like she's just dealing with a lot of other stuff right now this isn't even like on her mind and it's true it really wasn't but then as it got closer, I got, like, really excited and everything, but also scared again, because I was like, what if something goes wrong again? Right. Being the experience I just had. So we get there, and basically they tell me you're not going to be able to be incontinent like how you are or use a catheter vaginally. They're just like, it's not an option after, like, what they did to you in Staten Island the only option is a metrophanol. So they explained to me what it was going to be and um, went in for my surgery. I wound up having like seven other things done Mm. just because, you know, I haven't been there in so long that they kind of just took advantage of it. So it was being an 18 hour procedure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) So I feel bad for my family on that one. They were just in the waiting room (laughs) for 18 hours they were saying they're like we saw the screen and everyone's name kept like disappearing as in like Waiters they're was done, just like, a constant on the screen <laughs> and my name just stayed there it was the last one <laughs> they're like, of course cam of course you take the longest <laughs> but i had so i have a neo bladder because my other bladder was just gone like it just wasn't it was too small i don't i don't think that it never grew but after being torn they're just like we're just going to get rid of it so i have a neal bladder constructed of part of my large intestine mm-hmm. and my appendix so that means like when i cath i really don't even feel it because you don't feel anything with your appendix really oh that's so, weird you can't even feel it like okay it's confusing because then when i have so i'm on a four-hour schedule right now say i lose track of time and i go five six hours without peeing which i have before I'll get, like, really itchy around the area, and, like, it'll look, like, red, like, kind of, like, not hives, but kind of, like, the starting of a rash, like, splotchy. Yeah. And, like, oh, I should probably pee. It's been, oh, six hours. Yeah, I should probably pee. And I can feel that, and I get, like, slight cramping where, like, I feel like I'm going to throw up. But besides that, I don't feel it, really. Mm-hmm. It'll be very occasionally that I'll get, like, a sharp pain, and I'm like, oh, got to pee. But I really don't feel it, which I guess is nice. In a way. I, I don't know the feeling. So it's like you can't miss something that you don't have. Right. So there's that. So in the procedure, besides constructing my neal bladder, they made me the metrophanov and some vaginal stuff that had to be done just because, you know, I'm older mm-hmm. and the whole area had to be fixed. And they made me ureters that I didn't have, and 
it's honestly a long list and I don't know exactly everything that they did, but that's like the gist of it. So came out of that and it was horrible. I mean, laying on a metal operating table for 18 hours ruins your back. (laughs) So I had really, really bad back pain for like months after that. Like I had an epidural in the hospital, so it kind of helped, but I was laying on my back for like, besides all those 18 hours, even when I got out, like I was in the hospital bed for, I think a week, I was bedridden for a week and then I couldn't lay on my sides or anything like that or on my stomach. So I was just always on my back and took such a toll on my back that like, it was horrible because even when I came home, I had two bags. Yeah, coming out of my slides. So while I was in the hospital, they were monitoring me and they were like, something's not right. Like, you're still leaking. I was like, oh, you would know you did it, you know? So it turns out behind my left kidney, there was an extra ureter hiding. So (laughs) I have three ureters instead of two, like you should have. Yeah. So I have three. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And they didn't see it. It's not their fault. I mean, they they didn't see it, you know. Only, I think, like, 13% of people have a third ureter. And, of course, I would fall in that 13%. (laughs) So that's why I still leak. Because that's not attached to, like, anything, if that makes any sense. So it's still a leak. So I have a little bit of a leak still. Nothing like how it was. Like literally minimum to what it was even like more than half can you get away with like just light days and stuff like that now like not wearing a pad you mean yeah like just wearing a pad or instead of like full pull-ups oh no i wear pads i wear like poise pads yeah and i get underwear which is super exciting sounds so weird saying that but it's very exciting to be able to wear underwear but honestly after wearing like a pull-up for so many years wearing a pad like it kind of feels like nothing changed but it's just a lighter output. Mm-hmm. I don't have to change as often. Again, depending on how much you drink and if you're on your period and everything like that. But yeah, I was going from changing like maybe like eight times a day or more to maybe four, maybe less. So that's really that's nice. much less so, often, yeah. Yeah. So when I was in the hospital and they found out that I had the third ureter, they're like, okay, well, We need to do something about it. They didn't want to start operating on me again right away because I was in no condition to go into another operation. I, I'm very, you could see I'm very small as it is. I, before my surgery was the healthiest I ever was. I was, don't judge me. I was 95 pounds. (laughs) That was healthy for me. I dropped to 77. Oh my gosh. So I was like a skeleton. I was like skin and bones. So I was in no condition to go under the knife again because... You'd lose even more weight. Yeah, that's scary. Honestly, my parents were like, we know that you want this surgery, but be smart in making your decision because you are so sick right now, you might not make it through the surgery. Like, they were just being real with me. And I was like, no, you're right. Like, as much as I want it, it could wait. So that's kind of where I'm at now. They put a nephrostomy bag in that's where it like connects to your kidney Mm -hmm. I had a nephrostomy bag and a I think it's called a foley bag I could be getting the terms wrong I apologize in advance (laughs) but um so I had those two bags one on my left one on my right for from April to July so that was pretty annoying because I couldn't enjoy my summer like I planned on doing I was still held back from doing a lot of stuff I was very, very sick that when I came home from Hopkins, I wound up just, I basically like just laid in bed all the time. Like I didn't try to move. I didn't try to eat. Like I literally could not eat. And it was really bad because that was just making it worse. Right. I would, I would say my sister still makes fun of me for it. I would say my body won't let me eat because I was just so, I think just everything that was happening in my life at that point I was so depressed that I was just like yeah I don't even know the word for it I just wasn't there it's like it wasn't me it was a totally different person and like everyone says that they're like you weren't you for that amount of time however long that was but 
it was really, really bad. Like I would look at myself in the mirror and I would just like be disgusted because I'm like, this is so gross. I hate this. I hate my life right now. And that's not like me. Like I'm usually a very like smiley person, pretty like upbeat. And I was just miserable every single day. And it just, I felt like nothing was getting better. It got so bad that I wound up putting myself back in the hospital, but I was at a local hospital this time because Hopkins was just too far at that point. And it wasn't that bad that I needed to go to Hopkins. I wound up just having a kidney infection that mm. my pee was red. Oh, it was bad. Um, from blood or from something else? It, I don't think it was from blood. I think it's just because I wasn't eating and I was I wasn't drinking water. The malnutrition I was, like, so was just making it a different color. Yeah. So wow. in my holy bag that I had, like it was it looked like I don't even know. Like it looked like fruit punch. <laughs> that's what it looked like. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of something red. But like that's literally what it looked like. And my parents were like, Okay, this is not good. Like, let's get you to the hospital. So I went to a local hospital. They also didn't know what they were doing, but it was just a kidney infection. So it was like manageable, but I still had all my bags. So I had to like explain to them everything and it was really bad. And I think that I was there for, it's hard to remember. I tried to like block that part out because it was really bad. I want to say like three to five days I was maybe there, maybe longer. It was just a whole different experience because Hopkins, I was in the children's wing, even though like, I was 19, like, I was still allowed to be in the children's wing. In my local hospital, they just put me in the adult wing. So it's, like, you don't get, like, that care that you need. Like, Hopkins, I would, like, if I needed something, I would, like, ring the little bell, and, like, somebody would be there in, like, two seconds. This hospital, it was, like, no, we're going to take, like, an hour to get to you. So it was really bad. Basically, what they did for me there, I think they put me on an IV to get some nutrition in Mm -hmm. me. And I started feeling better. After a few days, I was able to come home, and yeah, after that, I was like, okay, I really need to start taking care of myself now. I need to eat. I need to drink. I need to try to move around, and then in July of 2019, I went back to Hopkins. They took out my Foley, my nephrostomy bag, and then they also started working on, like, vaginal stuff with me, so, like, dilation. I don't know if you had to go through that or not. I didn't have to go through dilation. Maybe because, like, you had work on you done from when you were younger and I didn't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, I've had work done down there, but I didn't have dilation. I'm not sure then, but I was, I had to go through dilation. Not a fun process. It doesn't sound (laughs) fun. I don't envy you at all. (laughs) I don't even want to explain it on here. Like, I want to keep it PG. (laughs) Yeah, so I had to go through that. And after that, I was taken off of bags and everything like that. So I was not good because, you know, I was still struggling to gain the weight back. I honestly still am struggling to gain the weight back and it's been three years. Wow. But I just, I have a hard time gaining weight in general. Like it took me a long time to get to that 95 that I was at and I felt so good and then I lost it all. (laughs) So yeah, I was just kind of trying to regain any like strength or anything that I had until I had to go back to school in the fall and then after that it's kind of just been normal as much as I could say I'm calfing every four hours what else dilating when I need to and I would just go back just locally like I go to a radiology place and I just have to get ultrasounds once a year on my kidneys and my bladder just to make sure everything's functioning well yeah you not on any medications or anything like that? No, for a while before, like leading up to the surgery in April, from January to April, I was on Miralax. Okay. It's basically just like this powder that you put in a drink and then it like helps you go to the bathroom. Okay. So I guess I was having a problem going to the bathroom, not realizing it, but now like it's really not a problem I think because they manipulated my like large intestine and stuff like that it's not bad anymore but when I was a kid a lot I would get constipated all the time Mm. I don't know if that's like a side effect with bladder extra figure or something like that but literally like my mom be like she would be like crushing up 
prunes and raisins and giving me anything to try to go to the bathroom because I would get like super sharp pains in my stomach because I just wasn't going. Hmm. That might have just been a me problem. No, I've, I've talked to a few people now who have also had problems with constipation and pain in their stomachs. So, I yeah, wonder. But since the it's been fine. So, they also said after my surgery, they're like, it might take her a while to start her menstrual cycle again. So, just, you know, monitor that. And, you're, and if there's any problems, let us know. Literally, the next day, I started my period. <laughs> so I was like, nope, wasn't a problem. <laughs> So, thank God, like, that whole reproductive... I haven't had any issues with that. Not any issues, because I know... I don't know any people personally with it, but it could be an issue. Yeah. So, thank God it's not. I'm all... They said in that department, they're like, she can have children when she's ready, and I get my period. I just get really sick on my period, yeah. but I think that's more genetic, because I talked to my mom about it, and she's like, no, I... I used to get really sick with my period too when I was your age. Like she would faint all the time from it. So it's happened. I've I've but fainted I'm, from my period before as well. So yeah, it's bad. Like it's really bad. I think again, I think that's just like genetically an issue. But then there's sometimes that I don't even know that I have it. So I'm like, oh, but I'm wearing a pad anyway, so it doesn't even matter. Right. <laughs> Lucky. So that's, how you, that's <laughs> <for> that. <laughs> trying to think if there's like anything else that I'm leaving out. So you haven't had that last surgery yet that you wanted to have? No. Because I had my initial, like my, I like to call it my big surgery. So I had my big surgery in April 2019. Once I was okay and healthy to go back for another surgery, I was going to schedule it, but COVID happened. Right. So that kind of threw a wrench in the plans. But it's livable you know it doesn't really restrict me from doing anything I can wear a bathing suit without anything I mean there's a little leak here and there but like I'm okay with it so unless I know I'm going right in the water I won't wear anything with a bathing suit but if I know that I'm going to be like hanging out outside the pool for a while I'll like just throw on a pad with my bathing suit bottoms and it's not a problem but yeah, so it it was very emotional the first time, though, that I put on a bathing suit and didn't have to wear anything with it, because I always imagined that moment, and then I was finally able to partially do it, and I was like, oh my god, this is insane. I don't know. It's just like little things yeah. like that. Like, even the first time that I cath, it was very emotional. I was like, oh my god, I'm peeing. <laughs> but like, I'm controlling right. it, sort of super emotional experience but I've also had problems with caffeine here and there like especially when I first started I had an issue literally the day I was coming home from the hospital like we were on our way home we were at a rest stop and I was like okay like I have to pee I was on a two-hour schedule at that point and I put in the catheter and it just wouldn't go in oh god I had a Foley bag so I was able to just unhook it and pee like that I had to do that a few times, but now cathing is my only outlet. Like if I can't get the catheter in, it's a problem. So a lot of times I do have that issue. I had it like last month, I think, and not good. I remember the first time I couldn't get my catheter in when I was off the bags, I freaked out. Turns out, and I think this also has to do with my large intestine being a part of my bladder now, I had... I'm sorry, this is going to be very gross. That's okay. <laughs> Mucus blockage. Okay. Like, literally, like, the size of my fist. Maybe, like, both my fists put together. Wow. It was very large. And, obviously, you know, the mucus is in the way. You can't pee. And I went to my local hospital that had no idea what they were doing. And they were able to somehow extract the blockage through the catheter although I don't know how they did that because with a blockage like that it was just insane and then after that they were like okay just keep like a catheter in your Mitrofenov and then just like cap it off and then when you have to pee just like open it I took it out as soon as I came home I was like no way I'm not doing this again (laughs) no and I I think a few months after that I had to go in for another blockage but since then it hasn't been something that I can't do at home where it's like severe like that Every now and then I'll get a blockage, but it just takes me a minute to get the catheter in. But I literally freak out when that happens. Like I 
start having a panic attack. Like I start breathing really heavy. I start sweating. Like just my anxiety goes through the roof and I start crying and I'm like, oh my God. So usually what I do, even though like, not that she doesn't know what to do, but I'll like be like, mom, I need help. (laughs) And she'll just kind of like sit with me and I don't, well, you don't cat, so, but I am very sensitive about like my, I call it a stoma, even though I know it's not, but my Mitrofenoff area, I don't let anyone else cath for me, even if like need be. Mm -mm. Yeah, I just like, I'm, I don't know why I feel like, unless it's like my doctors at Hopkins, because like they know what they're doing. I don't let anyone else touch me unless it's an absolute emergency because I feel like I know what I'm doing over everybody else. So my mom's like, do you want me to? And I'm like, no, don't touch me. Like, please. So she'll just kind of like sit there with me and like breathe with me. And I don't know if this makes sense, but I have to like calm down my bladder to be able to get the catheter. And, And that is one of the hardest things to do when you are so nervous like that. It takes at least like 10 minutes of me just like sitting there with cramps from not peeing. And I'm like, okay, I need like, it's just the worst thing in the world. And then when it finally goes in, I'm like, get the saline and start pumping it in. Like, yeah, cleanse it. (laughs) It's very like stressful. Like even like talking about it, I feel like I'm getting anxiety, but it hasn't happened in like a little over a month. So I think we're okay. (laughs) But it's, literally one of the scariest things that happens i don't know if like anyone else can relate to that i know i talked to kylie about it and she's like i hate it so much it's the scariest thing in the world but that's my only outlet yeah so it's not like i could be like, okay i'll just sit on the toilet i can't do that right <laughs> so that's the only other like scary thing that i deal with i just i hate that yeah. feeling yeah i mean it sounds like right now you have a good system with your mom like even just that emotional support of just like you're here with me I'm still gonna do it but you're here with me and that makes me feel calmer and more like I can handle it yeah Yeah, just like I need the support yeah (laughs) but I think just mentally like I don't want to say this like the whole medical messes with you mentally it honestly matures you but it also like could mess with you a little bit. And I feel like I'm just have more anxiety because of it and everything like that. Like before I was going into my big surgery, I was obviously freaking out because I'm like, oh my God, what if what happened the last time happens this time? So my sister, my mom, and my dad were sitting in the pre-op with me and I was just crying to them. And I'm like, I don't want to sound mean or heartless when I say this because they were always there for me. They were my biggest support system and they still are. But you don't get it. You don't know what I'm going through. Yeah. Like, nobody gets it. Because I didn't meet anybody with bladder extricate until I met Kylie, which was after my surgery. No, it was after I was operated on, but it was in April of 2019. But I never met anybody. I was never in support groups for it. I never went to any, like, picnics because they have some of those sometimes didn't know anybody else with this condition I literally thought I was the only one so when you meet somebody and you're able to talk to them so many things with Kylie I was like oh my god you get it and she's like yeah of course I get it like we have like the same story almost and I was like but no one ever gets it no one ever understands what I'm saying so I actually my sister found Kylie for me when I was being operated on they felt really bad about what I said and my sister researched what bladder extra free support group or something like that and her parents camp came up and she emailed Kylie and Kylie was on mission at that time in I think she was also in Maryland so it was really cool but she couldn't come see me which is totally understandable but we wound up meeting up like two months later and honestly I haven't seen her in person since but we talk like every week so but it was it was so nice to finally have someone understand what you're going through because for 19 years, I felt like I was on my own. Yeah. And it was just the hardest thing in the world because you've probably had it too. I mean, you have good days and you have bad days even now. Yeah. But especially 
when you're a preteen, it, you have a lot of bad days. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Like, a lot of times, because I was wearing pull-up, my middle school, we wore uniform and we wore khaki pants. A lot of times, I would wait until lunch to go to the nurse's office and change and everything like that. And not realizing it, I would leak through my pants. Oh, no. Yeah. Khaki pants, you obviously could see because they're very light. And it was not good. Severe anxiety. Again, like, I would try to, like, tie, like, something around my waist. I'd try to, like, make my bag, like, cover my butt. Like, it just, between that and everything, it was just such a mess. Like, I think back on it and I'm like, how did I do that for 19 years? Even in high school, I didn't have to wear a uniform there, but still, like, I would still wet through my pants, you know? Now I still wet through my pants with a pad. Like, you don't realize it and you're like, oh my god, I'm, like, leaking a lot. But Yeah, I understand yeah, so that. that. I always had a sweatshirt or a jacket I could tie around my waist. I had to learn to just always do that. Yeah. Just always keep a sweatshirt or something with me because in the event, you tie it around your waist. But then there's always, like, maybe because I'm crazy, but <laughs> there was always that fear in my head. I'm like, oh my God, they could smell it. Like, I feel like you could smell it or someone's going to see it and they're not going to understand. Then I have to be like, oh, I just sat in water. Right. Water dries a lot quicker than pee. So yeah, always like dealing with that situation too. was just annoying. Yeah. I mean, in, in elementary school, I feel like you could get away with it to a certain degree. It's like, oh no, I wet my pants, but like you're in elementary school. So like, yeah, you know, but once you get to middle school, it's not how it is. Right. You know, it's like, what's wrong with you? Why are you wetting your pants? Right. So in elementary school, a lot, like I mentioned, like I went to the nurse, but K to fifth, my mom, like during lunch, she would come to the school. I'd go to the nurse. She'd change me and like freshen me up and everything. And then I'd go. So like, I always like was at the nurse. And then when I hit middle school, she was like, okay, I'm not going to come take care of you anymore. Like you have to do it. I was like, okay, like I'm old enough now, it's fine. So I would do the same thing. I would go to the nurse during lunch. The nurse knew, obviously. The school knew. Like the school, the principal and everything was aware. And I would go take care of myself and leave. And I did the same thing in high school. My middle school and high school were actually like the same building. Okay, yeah. So it was the same nurse. So the nurse knew me for like, what is that, seven years? So it was really nice. I would just like go and I'm like, hey, like I'm just... She's like, go, you're fine. Just go. <laughs> Except for when there was like a substitute nurse, then I had to explain and then things got really weird and they never believed me half the time. And I was like, just let me use the bathroom. Like, I don't know why you're being like this. So I don't know. New what Yorkers. Would they would have like <laughs> briefed the substitute nurse or whatever. Right. Yeah. Like, they have this one yeah. student. <laughs> just let her use the bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of kids would go into the nurse at lunch, like, who had, like, diabetes and had to take, like, insulin or whatever else, and I would just go in to use the bathroom, and I had, like, a cubby where I'd keep, like, a bag with, like, extra stuff in it, and a lot of times, especially when the nurse wasn't there, like, a substitute nurse was in, they would lock the cabinet, Mm -hmm. so, like, no one could go in the cabinets, so I would go to get my stuff, and the door would be locked, and I'm like, can you unlock this, and they'd be like, why, and yeah, it was just... I feared those days. I was like, oh my God. I remember one time I, the nurse didn't believe me. I kept my stuff in the cabinet and I was like, can you unlock the cabinet for me? And she was like, well, you have to show me like your stuff. So like, I believe you because like, I'm having a lot of kids in here today say that they need to use the bathroom. So I literally had to, I I used like a, like a purse, like lunchbox thing. Mm -hmm. I zipped it open and I showed her and I'm like, look. And I pulled them out. I was like, look, like, it's a diaper. I have to wear it. And she was like, oh, okay. And she walked out of the bathroom. I cried in that bathroom for, like, 20 minutes and, like, snuck out of the nurse's office because I was just like, why Why did she have to do that to me just now? Yeah, that's so shaming. I was like, I come in here every day. And she's she didn't believe me. And I'm like, you literally made a kid cry because you are being ignorant. Yeah. Like, I just, I can't. And I, I don't remember, I didn't tell my parents about that. I, like, refuse to. So when they listen to this, they'll hear it and they'll be like, what? Why didn't you ever tell us that? <laughs> yeah, that was, like, the worst experience that I had at school. But no one knew at school. Like, I kept my life private. Like, my parents, they wanted to keep my medical and my social life or my school life. They just wanted to keep that separated. 
and I understand. So I didn't tell anybody. So when I would go to the nurse, my friends, like in more so in high school, they'd be like, why do you go to the nurse? And I'm like, oh, I just have asthma. <laughs> that was my excuse. I was like, oh yeah, I have asthma. I just got to like take my inhaler or whatever. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I just liked keeping things private because my mom would always tell me this and it's not necessarily true, but growing up, you know, kids could be really, really mean. Yeah. Especially in a situation like this, where it's like, you're very vulnerable in this situation, especially as a kid you are. I just didn't want anyone to like tease me for it or treat me different because of it. So my mom was like, what people don't know, they make fun of. Yep. So I was like, yeah, I mean, they were protecting me. Rightfully so. I mean, I would do the same thing. So no one ever knew. It was only family, obviously, principals and my teachers. And that's it. I didn't start telling people. I told my best friend in high school. But it took me until our junior year to tell her. Wow. Yeah. So, and then when I told her, she was like, why didn't you tell me sooner? Like, I could have been there for you, like, when you had, like, an issue and stuff like that. Because I would literally, like, if I felt like I went through my pants in high school, I'd be like, can you check me? Like, can you, yeah. <laughs> you know? And she'd be like, yeah. And if she was like, yeah, you did. I, she was like, okay, like, I'll stand, like, close behind you until, like, we get to your locker to find, like, another pair of jeans for you. And so... She's like, I could have been there for you in situations like that. And I was like, I'm sorry it took so long. It's just, I mean, you have to understand I was scared. And she's like, no, like, totally. Like, I completely understand. And then uh, she was the only friend of mine that knew until, honestly, she's the only friend that knew. I didn't start really being vocal until after my surgery. Mm -hmm. You have friends now that you have that know. Yeah. Friends are aware now. My boyfriend's aware. His parents are aware. Yeah. I'm just a lot more open about it because it's like, I don't know if this makes sense, but like it, I feel like it was a lot more judgy in the other situation that I was in than it is now. Yeah. I don't know if it makes sense. No, that, no, that makes sense. Yeah. It's like, I'm 18 years old and I'm wearing a diaper. Whereas like now it's like, okay, well I'm 23 and I just pee out of my stomach. Right. And it's really cool. <laughs> It's a party trick. <laughs> That's actually how I told my boyfriend about this. It was so funny. Like, I I told him. I was really nervous because my past relationship, I was kind of rejected because of this. But this was also prior to my surgery. And it was just a whole issue and kind of like judgment. So I was like, you know, you, you hurt from that. Right. So... I just told him straight out, like, I think it was our third date or something like that. We were about to go on our third date, and I called him, and I was like, hey, I need to tell you something, and he was like, okay, what's up? And I'm like, so I have a medical condition where I pee out of my stomach, and I pee at the time. It was, like, every two hours, so I was like, I have to pee every two hours, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And he's like, so what food are we getting today? <laughs> I was like, oh, of course, <laughs> of course. And then that's when I knew I was like, he's a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> so literally that was his response. And it was the best response I could have asked for because he was just like, I don't, not that I don't care. Cause obviously he cares. Like he's on me about, he's like, it's four hours, go to the bathroom, go pee. So I'm like, thanks. But he was just like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't really matter to me like that. You're still you. I still really want to go out with you. And, you know, whatever happens, happens. And I'm like, where did you come from? <laughs> a lot of people aren't like that. Yeah. That's so, great. Thank you. So supportive. He is. Like, I talked to him a lot about it. Like, still, like, I was telling him about the podcast and he was really happy about it. And I was just like, yeah, it just feels good to, like, talk about it. And again, he's on top of me. Like, in certain situations because like his friends don't know so when we go out with his friends like I'm very like try to like keep that stuff like very like private and if for some reason like it come not comes up in conversation but I'm like oh I have to go to the bathroom or something and I take a longer time he'll just like make up an excuse for me because it takes me a little bit longer to use the bathroom yeah. being that I have to count everything so or if there's like a problem like say like I can't get the catheter in I'll just, like, go up to him. I'll be like, we need to leave. And he'll be like, okay, like, let's go. 
or anytime we go on vacation, he's like, I made sure there's a hospital really close by in the event anything happens. So I was like, thank you so much. Like, I I couldn't ask for anything better, yeah. basically. Like, it's like the perfect scenario. That's wonderful. So. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Body Talk with Bex. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts at. Also consider becoming a patron on patreon.com. We just rolled out some new great stickers. They're also available on the website. If you would like to share your story or know someone who does, I can be contacted through my website, www www.bodytalkwithbex.com or on social media and of course tune in next week to hear the second half of this conversation with Cameron. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to Body Talk with Bex. This week is the second half of my interview with Cameron. Let's just jump right into this week's episode. And your your parents have always been just open and you know always discussed with you everything. So they kind of, how do I explain this? They let okay. me talk about it when I wanted to. Like, obviously they explained it to me when I was a kid, but I don't remember. My dad a lot when he would explain it to me though, would draw pictures, like just to explain it a little <laughs> bit better, even though I had no idea what he was saying. And I was just like, uh-huh, that's really yeah. cute though, drawing <laughs> pictures. <laughs> they... <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it made more sense as a kid to draw stuff like that. And he'd be like, these are ureters. He's like, you don't have these or something like that. Like, however, it would be explained to a kid. And um, they let me come to them. So like, if I was just like, why am I wearing a diaper? Like, I just knew like not to talk about it, like in front of people that I knew to only talk about it with my parents. That was very clear from the beginning. They were like, you don't show anyone your pull up. You don't tell anybody about it like basically like it doesn't exist but you still need to be like careful I knew that from a young age right away but anytime it came up in conversation like it would I would always be the one to address it I don't know how exactly I'd probably just be like why can't I wear underwear was probably the question and then they would explain to me why but it was they always let me come to them unless it was like really like severe where I was going for a surgery or something then they would talk to me about it, but usually I think that's it was really me going the to best them. way to do it because it kind of creates that like open channel of communication where you feel comfortable asking them, and like they're they're going to give you an honest answer, mm-hmm. so you kind of yeah. like learn like if I just ask, they'll tell me. Yeah, they were very open talking about it. It was never like, well, we can't talk about that. It was never like that, and even my sister too. She was very supportive. Like, she still is, like, super supportive in the whole situation. So it's always nice to have that, too. And also, my parents didn't really know, you know, because my sister doesn't have it, but I do. That's like Kylie. Like, her older sister doesn't have it, and her younger brothers don't have it, but she does. So, and no one knows why it really happens, necessarily. I mean, I've asked my doctor multiple times, and he's like, it might be something to do with one of your chromosomes, but honestly, we don't know. I'm like, well, that's nice. Maybe not in our generation. (laughs) No, sadly, but I mean, right? It's what it is. It wasn't genetic, like yeah, for me, wasn't genetic for me either. But I have an older brother, and he doesn't have it, and I'm the only person in our family that has it. Me too. So I just, it literally just came out of nowhere. No, there was no preparation or anything like that. But as I got older, I asked more questions because I was able to understand what was going on and why I couldn't do certain things. So a lot of times, like about the bathing suit thing, I would like break down and my mom would have to explain to me, like, if you want to go, it's one phone call. And I'm like, but I'm not ready for that yet. I just want this to be over. And then even like after my my big surgery, like I had multiple breakdowns still especially when I still had like all the tubes and everything. I was like, why am I like this? Why was I made like this basically? And my parents were like, we're so sorry. Like, I don't want to say I was mad at them because I can't be mad at them. It's not their fault, but I feel like they were my only outlet. And I probably like, I don't know. I feel like I was so mean to them. Like I specifically remember one night, I think it was the night I came home from a dilation or something like that maybe. And I was just like, why am I like this? 
why was I born like this? Why me? All this stuff, just like going at them, like so angry. And I was like, you don't get it. You're never going to get it. And they were like, we're sorry. Like, this is just sounds terrible, but this is just how it is. Like, you kind of just have to deal with it. But (laughs) they said it a lot nicer than that. (laughs) But it was just, I don't know. I'm sure you had those like moments too. Oh yeah. I think I had them a lot more as a teenager. Yeah. As a kid, I was just sort of like happy and didn't really care all that much. Yeah. But definitely as a teenager, I got, I don't know if I really verbalize it a whole lot, but I definitely internalized then like wondered why. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know. And like, I don't blame my parents for not putting me through the surgeries when I was a baby because so much has Mm -hmm. changed in technology and I know they might still be working on it when I was like a kid they were trying to work on the clone in the bladder I don't know I don't think that's happened yet but they were they were working on that I mean now I don't know what they would have done for me then probably like what they did now but I don't know if they would have known how to make a neo right who knows what kind of technology they had at the time and what would have happened and I, and I might have had to go for like multiple procedures yeah. because you know your body's developing, your bladder is growing, things might change. So it was just, although it sucked, <laughs> it was my best bet to wait until I was old enough to make the decision myself. Cause it just, it also was just such like a transformation period for me in general. Like the person that I was prior to surgery is not the person that I yeah. am now, like post surgery. And like people say that to me all the time. They're like, you are. And not in a bad way. They're like, you are a totally different person that it's like, it's great. Like I'm so much more open and so much more like knowledgeable about the subject and just like, just a whole different person. And I don't take things for granted as much because honestly, like if I went in for that second procedure, I yeah. just literally died on the operating table. So it's just, and then like not long after surgery. So I was operating on in April I was still pretty sick. October, my sister and I were on our way to school and we got into a really, really bad car accident. Like the car was totaled oh, wow. completely on my side of the car. Like I was in the passenger's car was completely totaled. And I'm like literally surprised that we made it out of that car alive. So even after that, I'm like, oh my God, I value things like so much more. So it's just like little things. And also being in that accident could have caused a lot of harm yeah. to my bladder. Like it was still very new, you know? So we were also worried about that. Like I went to the hospital and they're like, can you like check her out and everything like that? And thankfully I was completely That's fine. Impressive. Not like a scratch <laughs> on us, but a lot of stuff just has happened since the surgery. And it's like, I, I don't know how I'm alive half the time. Like I think about it and I'm like, everything that I went through, how did I make it out of that? Because <laughs> between the severe depression I had, between the operations between the car accident and just like everything else like I don't know how I did it and how I'm like here to talk about it and that's a good thing but it's it's just like you don't I don't really take life for granted as much as I did yeah crazy year well do you have plans in the future to have that last surgery or I would love to obviously it's a dream to be continent but with COVID it's really hard because obviously I want my family there in the hospital with me and it's yeah they have a lot of restrictions still so again it's livable I'm kind of just dealing with that but yeah I would love to go for that sometime soon within like the next two years if possible I want to try to not like knock that surgery out and like not have to yeah go for any more surgeries that would be really nice because although I love John Hopkins, yeah, like, no one wants to go for another surgery. And it's just like hanging over right. my head all the time. I'm like, oh, I still have to do this. Because if COVID didn't hit, right. I definitely would have had it by now. So, and it's been three years and I haven't had the surgery. So, but I'm just happy that I got the surgery when I did because yeah, you're lucky you did get it COVID. <laughs> when you did. Yes, because I know somebody who had the surgery during COVID. And I was like, that must have been horrible. (laughs) Like, I can't imagine going through everything that I did 
on top of COVID in the hospital. So like, so much it more stress and, ten and like worse. precautions and literally. Wow. Yeah, I was literally a year off. Yeah. So good thing. And you're still working it. on trying to put weight back on as well, right? Yeah. At the moment, I'm like 90, 91 pounds. So I'm very close, but it's also like, yeah, I just need to gain weight. <laughs> I'm like a very, very small person. So I need to just kind of put that weight back on. And that's very easy with the way that I eat. I'm surprised that I didn't gain it by now. But besides that, I mean, I'm very close with Kylie. That's why I keep bringing her up. We're like, we're like this, we're besties. She's helped me a lot. She was like my rock through all of this because I had my parents as a support system, but talking to somebody you barely know, she literally called me one night and she was like, hey, and she explained who she was. And from like that moment, she was like, yeah, I'm here if you need anything. And yet she's on mission. And she was just always there for me and helped me through so much. Cause I remember talking to her. We talked every, I think we talked every night or like every Monday night or something like that. And she was like, I'm here for you. And I would just invent to her. I would cry to her. And it was just so nice. Cause she's like, I totally get what you're going through. And I never had that. And she still is now. Like we do the support group together. We do a, yeah, we do a support group over Zoom once a month. We skipped the month of June, I think, or June. Like no one can make the appointment. And it's, the days vary, but we try to meet at least once a month. And there's so many people that we talk to, like people from everywhere. Like we have someone in Alaska that comes on and just like all over the place. It's really nice to just like get everyone together. And honestly, half the time, we don't even talk about anything medical. We just catch up on our lives. But if we do want to talk about something medical, it's very easy to because you mentioned something. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, I've gone through I think I'm going to join for the one in August. So. Okay. So you should. I think it's on the 12th. Mm-hmm. So, Friday. yeah. Yeah. But I've also you never been to out. a group like that before. Mm-hmm. So. It was so scary the first time Kylie and I were like freaking out. (laughs) Like we were literally like on Zoom before. We're like, oh my God, this is so scary. But afterwards we're like, that went great. Like that couldn't have gone any better. Everybody felt so comfortable. And we just had like a huge, just random discussion. People are just throwing out questions. We, I don't know how to explain it. It just felt so like welcoming. And I look forward to it every month. I'm like, oh, I get to see like all my friends and everything it's just a different feeling like you feel so safe and it's nice because all those people too right don't have anyone to talk to so to have someone to talk to it's nice and it's also nice because I feel like we're even though it's very small I feel like we're like making a difference a little bit because I know if I had something like that when I was a teenager I would have loved it I felt like I wasn't alone like I was for all those years and it's just a lot of people say that they're like I feel like I'm not alone anymore like it's so nice like I didn't know that everybody like not everybody but I didn't know there were a lot of people out there like this I'm like yeah I didn't either yeah (laughs) until I think it's something that I've talked about with a few people that like there's a lot of us out there we're just like also spread out from each other yeah, but like if you put us all in a room really together, are. there's a ton of us. <laughs> and you know, like we don't just do like bladder extrophy, other like bowel. I forgot what the other one is called, but we do a lot of like other bowel issues too. There's people there with like literally everything. So it's it's very like welcoming, very just nice. I feel so like, I can't stop smiling when I get off the call, basically. I'm just like, this feels so good. And if I could just like help one person, then I feel like yeah. I'm helping a lot of people, if that makes any sense. I don't know, it just feels really good. Especially like, I want to give back because like Kylie did so much for me. So I feel like doing this with her, not only is it nice because I get to see her, but it's just like, I don't know. I can't explain the feeling. Yeah. It's just, maybe you'll see it when you come, but it's just such a good feeling. And we have new people come like every month. Like there's always more That's and more amazing. people every month. And I'm like, oh, you know, 
It's really nice. I don't know. I guess they're finding out oh. through like, the Facebook group or something like that. But it's just, it's something else to just do that. One, one of the meetings, we had significant others come on. And they were able to talk about their experiences and everything like that. So it was, it was nice. We try to like bring on like people. So whether it's your significant other, we would want to do parents maybe one time, but we haven't like done it yet. I know Kylie was talking about having like one of her doctors come on and talk. So I was like, yeah, it'd be perfect to ask questions for. And we might record that session maybe. So we just like have it. But yeah, we don't usually record them. So it's totally like, private. whatever you say, it's like, unless like, you know, someone says something, but it's, it's a safe space. And we say that too. We're like, we don't record. So you could feel completely comfortable. And then Kylie and I also offer like both, like I say, say to everybody all the time, like, if you don't feel comfortable talking in a large group, contact Kylie, contact me separately. And like, we'll hop on a Zoom and I'll just like talk to you. Cause I know like it's a scary situation. Sometimes people yeah. don't want to like put everything out there right away. A huge group of strangers. So we definitely offered that in the beginning. No one did it, but it's always there. We always say like, you could contact us whenever, if you just like have a question or you just want to talk, you want to vent. Yeah. You know, I'm sure it's nice it to just like have the option. I mean, if anything, it's just like demonstrating it what a safe space it is. Like, even if no one takes that option, mm-hmm. like just having it available. No, we try to also not make it so serious either. <laughs> like we have fun, like we play games and we'll just like talk. People bring their pets on. Like it's like every, <laughs> it's just good. Like it's just a little bit of everything. And you hear stuff that like, you wouldn't even think of like I know and when I was listening to your podcast too like everybody gets the females mm-hmm. at least get UTIs and that's like a huge issue for everybody and I'm like really? I don't get UTIs wow so I don't think I've ever had one I don't know I I was talking to my mom about it the other day and I was like yeah I don't get UTIs it's a very common thing in this medical condition like why I mean I'm not mad about it but like why and I think it boiled down to she's like you drink a lot of water (laughs) and I do drink a lot of water and I don't cath or anything vaginally you can still get UTIs through the Mitrofnoff because I've had them through there before that's strange then I don't know maybe I'm just (laughs) one of those people that doesn't get it (laughs) or I don't know maybe I'm just like very like sterile and (laughs) Cause you have to be too, you know, yeah. <laughs> very sterile in this situation. I don't know. I've yeah, no, one, so celebrate I'm not really it. upset about it. It's just <laughs> people talk about it. Yeah. People are like, oh, I got another UTI again. I'm like, no, is there something <laughs> wrong with me? <laughs> like, am I not getting them? <laughs> so, yeah, but that's like a really common conversation that we have. So yeah, definitely relatable. Like they're literally, you're like, oh my God, you go through that too. It's like little stuff. And we talk about relationships and you know everything to do with that judgment just like everything so it's just it's nice to have those conversations because again like it's hard to have those kind of conversations with fam or at least in my situation it's hard to have those conversations with family Mm -hmm. because they don't go through it and it's a whole different situation yeah I mean it's hard to really empathize when you've never really been through it Mm -hmm. like my parents are so like supportive about that and everything and they try to be but again they they're not going through it and even as like a parent with a kid going through it I commend them because you know I can only imagine how it was when I was born like the whole situation like my mom said when I was born when she came like when they came home from the hospital I didn't come with them like, I had to stay at the hospital because, like, I was operated on stuff. She's like, that was the hardest Aww. thing in the world to not come home with you. So, and I felt, like, terrible. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. But I can only imagine, like, seeing your kid, like, so innocent, just, like, go through this. And, like, they didn't ask for it. And you didn't ask for it. And it's yeah. just, like, a whole big mess in that situation, you know, unless you've kind of been through it before. But they they hadn't they had no idea what this was they heard of it and they just 
were very confused. They did research, obviously, yeah. but I mean, you yeah. barely hear about this even now, unless you're in the community, but like, you don't hear doctors talking about this. It's not in textbooks. Like, and right. if it is, it's like a one paragraph thing. And it's like, no, it goes far beyond that. Like, there's a lot of other things that go along with it. Like, you have the mental part of it, like, the physical part of it, just like the social it part of it. it. Yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> you know. I mean. So, I just wish that they did more research on it because it's annoying that they don't and that we yeah. still don't know why this no, happened. I to agree, us. definitely. Were you able to ever go back to college? Yeah. Have you finished or? Yeah. I am in my last year of college. I start in the fall, so I'll graduate <laughs> in May. God be willing. Um, and yeah, I I transferred colleges actually because I just didn't like the other college that I was at. So it was a good excuse to transfer also. So I'm in school. I am an education major. So I want to work with like K to three. So I'm currently in school just doing like my clinicals for it. So I go into classrooms and this semester I start not fully, but I'll start teaching in the classroom. And then besides that, I have very random minors I have. I have them, also my school is like pretty known for it, but I have a minor in Jewish studies and Holocaust and genocide studies. So it's like very, very random. (laughs) But yeah, I kind of just put my all when I went to my new school because I was just like, I hated my other school so much. <laughs> and I it just felt so welcoming. Like even one professor, I'm very close with her. My sister and I actually like went to her house like a few weeks ago and like spent the whole day with her. But she like welcomed me into that community and she's so understanding about my medical. I basically like just opened up to her right away and I told her like everything and she'll constantly ask me like are you going for your next surgery and I want to know when you get your next surgery and everything like that so it's nice to have people that aren't family treat you that way because I consider her like my school mom she's even like oh yeah like because my school is like an hour from here and she lives like five minutes from the school she's like even if you have to you could spend the night here I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. I trust <laughs> I her too. It's not a creepy situation. She's had kids before. Like, her and her husband are so sweet. And she's just like, yeah, you could spend the night if you want. Like, you would have your own bedroom and bathroom and everything. And I'm like, oh my god. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Thank you so much. But it's really nice to just have people like that. Because I've encountered people that judge you and they don't even know you. Like I've been referred to, I don't know if you've ever been referred to like this, but I was referred to as the one with the problem before. Mm -hmm. And it hurt so bad because it was somebody that I hadn't met. They only knew of me because it was like very, very distant family. And when they asked, and they didn't even try to like ask it like subtly, they literally asked it very loud. They're like, oh, is that the one with the problem? And I'm like, is that how I've been referred to this whole time in the family? Like, am I the one with the problem? And it just hurt so bad. I cried so much after that. And it was just like, why would someone do that? In the education field, when you talk about somebody and like their medical or their disability, it's like you put their name first. So like if someone had autism, you'd be like, oh, you wouldn't say like an autistic person. You'd say like, oh, a person Mm -hmm. with autism. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, why would you do that to me? I don't even know you. You don't know me. We've never met before. And you're going to refer to me like that. I don't know if they knew that I heard them say that, but that hurts. And even my mom was like, yeah, she has a medical condition, but it's not a problem. Like, it hurts when people, I've never, I've had someone else refer to me like that before, but I knew it wasn't like intentional. It was just because Mm -hmm. I don't think that they really understood what they were saying, but I mean, it doesn't make it hurt any less, but I kind of knew where it was coming from. So I was yeah. like, okay, like I'll let that one slide. But so yeah, I'm sorry. That's always stuck in my head. <laughs> no, it's okay. It, it was a few years ago anyways. It's not like it was recently, but it's just nice that like you would have like yeah. people like that, that don't talk like that, that actually have well, heart. I think it's <laughs> also that people just aren't educated so. on how to actually refer to people who have medical conditions and 
Yeah, like some people might be like, oh, it's not a sensitive <laughs> topic, but I don't know why. <laughs> no, I, I know that it is, but I'm saying like some people might not think that. And I know when I've like, and not like talking about it like this, but like when I've had to talk to people and explain the situation, I get so emotional when I told my boyfriend's parents, which I only told them recently and we're together two years I literally cried when I told them and their response was like the best ever. His dad, like we were at the dinner table and I told them over dinner and I was literally shaking and like squeezing my boyfriend's hand like before. And I was like, can you try to bring up the topic? I don't know how to bring this up. And he was like, guys, Cam has to tell you something. And I'm like, wow, yeah, (laughs) way to be subtle. (laughs) So I explained to them and I literally just broke down while telling them and his dad got up from the dinner table and like walked over to me and hugged me and he was like we love you no matter what kid like and and I was just like stop (laughs) like why why are you being so nice to me and I also waited so long to tell them because again Mm -hmm. I wanted them to know me for me and not my medical like when when I think of somebody like I don't think like Kylie for instance I'm not like oh Kylie she also has bladder extra I'm like Kylie my best friend right. oh yes yeah, she has bladder extra fake but I didn't want them to think like oh I don't know if I want to say my boyfriend's name or not but oh um our son girlfriend she's the one with the medical condition I wanted them to meet me fully know me and then if they want judge me on the side for that you know what I mean not like oh hi nice to meet you I'm Cameron right here's my life <laughs> So that's why I waited so long also to tell them. And I explained that to my boyfriend. He was like, no, like that totally makes sense. And like, I was literally going through anxiety the whole week leading up to telling them. I was like, I just think it's time. You know, summer's coming. I have a pretty big scar that shows when I wear a bathing suit. I don't want to have to hide it all the time. And they were totally cool with it. And then he was like, well, if anything, just tell them it's a shark bite, you know? It's not right. (laughs) It's shark week, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if you, like, your situation, I don't want to say your situation is different, but you don't cast there anything. So do you, like, how do you tell people if you do? Open about things. Honestly, I don't normally, like, really, yeah, I don't really, like, disclose Disclose. to people. But, like, if they ask where the scar scar comes from and things like that, then... I'm usually pretty honest about like, oh yeah, I grew up with bladder extrophy and this is a scar from a surgery I had when I was 11. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yeah. 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 Throw, That's kind of what I water. do. And usually people are pretty cool about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I guess because I just like grew up like not telling anybody, like it's takes me a long time to tell somebody if I really want to tell them. And then otherwise I'm like, they're not on a need to know basis. Yeah. So why? You know, like it's just yeah. It's I don't probably wasting my time. Like things no. that I'm currently struggling with. Like I won't <laughs> obviously tell them about my trouble at night and stuff like that. Like I save that kind of stuff for my closer relationships <laughs> and that that type of thing. Yeah, I feel like which like your situation is so good. Like you don't have to cat there or anything. So it's like, when it comes to explaining for me, I'm like, well, like, especially like explaining to his parents and stuff. I'm like, well, I have to cast. So like, God forbid there's an issue, you know? Like, I feel like that's why it takes me longer to like want to tell somebody. Cause I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm literally telling them how I pee. It's an conversation like, to have. <laughs> Yeah, but I also thought it's important for them to know because I spend a lot of time at my boyfriend's house and he still lives with his parents. So, right. God forbid, I can't get my catheter in at their house, which thankfully has never happened. But if it did, and he's like, we got to go to the hospital and we're running out and they're like, where are you they going? And we're know. like, oh, we're going to the yeah. hospital. They're kind of on a no basis. So that's also why I like disclosed to them because I just, like we recently went on vacation with them last weekend. So I was like, it's, right. it's important that they know. God forbid anything. Nothing happened, thankfully, but still it's important. So really just my family knows, my boyfriend's parents, only his parents know. I didn't tell his brother or anything like that. And like doctors and very, very close like friends. So like 
my best friend now and that professor I'm very close with, yeah. but I consider her like family anyways. Besides that, I'm very like private about it. Like this is the most like, what's the word to use? Verbal, yeah. I guess, about it that I've been. And I think that's why I was so nervous. I feel okay now, but it's the unknown. And like, I know you're not going to like be mean or anything like <laughs> that because I listened to your podcast already, but I was just like, it's just scary to put it out there because even like on social media or anything like I don't like put that out there anything like that so like literally like right. nobody that I grew up with knows so it's like if they hear this yeah. they know but it's, it doesn't really matter it's a big step though Good. but I'm happy that it happened it's kind of yeah it's just like not like oh it's time to be open about yeah. this but like it's also educating people so that's another reason to be open educating about it. people it's so connecting people kind of the same way that the zoom call is I think um yeah I mean it would be so cool if like whoever decides to listen to this podcast like it's like oh I want to go on the zoom call like that'd be awesome or you just like you know more people will reach out to you because of this and want to interview because I when I was listening to yours I don't know how to pronounce her name the woman from Scotland that you Yes, Christine. I like just finished listening to that podcast yesterday, I think. And I was like, oh my God, she's like all the way across the world almost. And like, it's so cool that you reached out to her and she yeah, was the first person yeah. that you that talked to. That was really to. cool. That's like- I got like goosebumps just because I was like, I can't believe that someone all the way across the world has the same condition and has had such similar experiences. It's just kind of mind blowing to think about. It's just crazy that it took you to make a podcast to meet somebody like that, like with your condition also that like you, and obviously it's not your fault or anything, but like that you hadn't met somebody sooner. It's cool that it gave you the opportunity to do that. And now it's opening you up to more people. And if you come to the meeting, you'll meet more people. Cause that's how I felt. I was like, okay, it's one person. And then like, I met a bunch of people. And I was like, Wait, there's a camp for this every yeah. year. And there's more people. A lot. <laughs> like, how many of us are there? <laughs> I know. And it's just like, ah, oh, it's such like a good feeling. But I can only imagine that must have been like mind blowing for you. You must oh, have had, yeah. like so many questions. And it has been. Yeah. It's, it's like been a really, really cool meeting story. people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm happy that you're able to meet people because of this. I just, it again, it's just a really good feeling just knowing you're not alone because I mean even like through hospitals and stuff like you never came across anybody else not with me I mean everybody I was in the hospital with had I mean other things going on I mean even after I had surgery and like shared a room Mm -hmm. with other inpatient kids they all had different things none of them were bladder extra few people That's just wild. I don't know. Maybe it was also the hospital that I went to. Like, I didn't meet anybody, but like, when my doctors would talk to me, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, like we just operating on somebody else with it." Like, it it's very common in this <laughs> hospital, and I'm like, "Why am I like yeah. the one?" Yeah, like I, I knew my doctor um, specialized in bladder <laughs> atrophy and like specialized in females, but I just never met any of them. <laughs> it just sucks that it's. I mean, I guess it's good because I wouldn't want more people to have to go through what we're going through, even though it's not like the worst thing in the world, but it sucks that our community is so small, even though it's really not, Yeah. but like, you get what I'm trying to say? Like, it's like so small that you don't hear about it. And I hate to even relate this to it, but like, you hear about cancer a lot. Cancers, like they have like hospitals, like St. Jude's and everything. So it's like, if a kid saw that on TV, they're like, oh, I know more people have cancer, even though it's horrible. And I hate that I'm even relating it to that. But, and our, we're nothing like cancer, but you know, right. we're not publicized it's kind of isolating. like that. Yeah, that's like the perfect word, honestly. We're, we're isolated and obviously it's not for any reason, but it, there's such a smaller population of us that yeah. we're not publicized annoying because it's like people then hear about it and they're like oh what's that meanwhile it's something that people should be very much aware of especially that it's a birth birth defect I don't know if you want to say defect I don't think that's a defect but yeah like a 
medical condition that you could be born with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even doctors and nurses at hospitals that don't specialize in it or anything, I feel like I I can't even count how many of them I've had to explain to them like what bladder atrophy is or like what a metrophenoff is. And it's just like, shouldn't even just like a regular nurse be educated on what it is? Like we're not that rare. (laughs) Yeah. They should be. I guess we are. But again, like we were saying before, like it's like a paragraph in a textbook and it probably just gets skimmed right. over because there's not that it's much just like, information. Oh, this on is it. a thing. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's just frustrating like that because again, like when I had to go to the hospital, my local hospital after my major surgery, they were like, wait, what did, what did you have done? You have a neobladder now? And I was like, yeah how do you not know what this is? I mean, I, I was probably one of the only people that walked in there with it. <laughs> Let's be real. But I mean, um, still as a doctor, you should know what this is. They have to do something about that. I don't make a, make us have like a chapter or something in a textbook, even though I don't know. <laughs> I don't no, think but there's, there's enough to give us a chapter. To I mean, I've done a lot of research for the podcast and I found enough information that I think collectively if you pull everything together (laughs) I think they could definitely have a full chapter (laughs) of information (laughs) they probably could it's just like I guess they don't see that on that high of a priority on the scale as opposed to something that's more like autism or or something like that which sucks for us but that'll change hopefully at one point in the near future we will have an answer of why this happened to us because it there has to be an answer like it's right. not just like this happened because it's not like it happened to one yeah. person it happened to a bunch of people so again I think my doctor said it like my 16th chromosome or something I think there was like something wrong with it didn't maybe like fully develop and that's why this happened but like there had to be a trigger like was it something that our mothers did didn't do but then again my sister doesn't have it yeah and Kylie's siblings don't have it either and your sibling doesn't have it when I was reading it sounded like something in the second trimester I think that like doesn't fully develop and that's what causes it mm-hmm. but like I don't know what it is that causes it not to develop so I don't know I don't know <laughs> yeah. yeah that's what they have to figure out <laughs> they're like something yeah. didn't develop well, we just thank don't you know for what coming is. on and talking to me about your experience did you have any other anything else you wanted to say or yeah uh, of course thank you um trying to think I mean just for whoever's listening, just know whatever condition it may be. It doesn't have to be bladder extrophy. You're not alone. There are much more people than you think out there with your condition, and they're going through the exact same thing that you are. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Body Talk with Bex. I hope you enjoyed the second half of my conversation with Cameron. If you did enjoy this episode, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts at. Also consider becoming a patron on patreon.com. And you can also check out the website and pick up a sticker or two if you don't want to join Patreon. If you would like to share your story or know someone who would, I can be contacted through my website, www.bodytalkwithbex.com, or on social media. Thanks for listening.